the picture archiving and communication systems. And really, largely what we're going to be looking at is, is just terminology that is common to this. And, and we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about some troubleshooting um, that can come with this. But, but largely what we, we want to do is just make sure we're, we're secure with the understanding of, of some uh, abbreviations and terms. So here's some objectives. And uh, we're going to define uh, HIS, HL7, RIS, DICOM. We'll talk about different components of PACS. Um, as well as define those, the function of those components and then finally we'll look at PACS storage and communication requirements because those largely are what drive how um, PACS uh, works and I've, I've selected some uh, sci-fi images from this. This is an x-ray of uh, Iron Man here. Um, it, see if you can name some of the other uh, x-rays and things that we have here later on in the lecture. So. HIS is just the hospital information system, sometimes called a clinical information system. And this is going to be what manages the administrative, financial, and clinical information needed to operate a hospital or healthcare system. A lot of times it's embedded in the EMR, but it actually is a separate, it, it has separate allowances from the EMR. Um, because if you just need to access a patient's chart, that's one thing. If, if you want to uh, control how billing works or something like that, um, there needs to be some uh, permissions and different kinds of access points. Health Level 7 um, is actually an organization, and they work to facilitate communication specifically between um, software systems in text form. Um, so it's, it's significant that this is a text-based system. You don't want to um, confuse it with uh, DICOM or something like that. It's text-based information. And so this is what, for example, the, the RIS uses to communicate um, the patient information to the CT scanner or even to like an EKG, a ECG ma machine or what have you. Um, and the significance here is that this HL7 connection, if, if it's not active, if you've ever been in a facility where you've had to manually enter um, patient information prior to doing imaging, they probably just lacked some kind of HL7 um, connection. There, there are machines that are out there that people are still using that were made before this compliance uh, system or, or for whatever reason the networking is, is down. But if, if there's a difficulty in communication, it's, so this is the troubleshooting issue I'm trying to drive at. If, if you are not getting patient information at your imaging station, like where you do your CT scan or your x-ray, probably the, the error is in the HL7, not in the, the PACS or anything like that. Um, so, but together, HL7 and DICOM are, are what makes it possible to create, store, and view images from a bunch of different kinds of manufacturers. So it operates independent of, of who made the, uh, the imaging uh, equipment. So here's a, a RIS, right? Um, and this is going to be the data system for any functionality related to just the radiology department. So scheduling, ordering, work lists are a big one, especially at facilities where management's watching really closely, like exam times and stuff like that. Patient data, and then it's commu there's communication between typically between the RIS and PACS. It just depends on again on the software platform and things like that whether how deep that connectivity goes, um, and so that that communication with PACS might be part of how reporting works, billing, and, and even patient trending. DICOM means uh, digital imaging and communication in medicine. And the book goes into uh, some historical notes about how it was made through a collaboration with the ACR and NEMA. NEMA is still very active in um, a lot of uh, standardization, um, particularly around imaging, um, but all sorts of different kinds of things. I mean, they're just not limited to uh, medicine. They, they do all sorts of stuff. Um, but they developed this, um, this standard back in the 80s. There was a recognized need for it. And it has really evolved into a very robust way of communicating image information. So let's talk a little bit more about what all the DICOM format provides. There's always going to be a header. Um, and this is st typically in the background, um, but so it's not apparent always in the image itself. But built into the image, there's data behind it that can record everything from KVP and tube current to a dose area product perhaps even the SID, depending on the machine that you're using, um, image format, receptor size, bit data, even an exposure index, 
patient info like their ID, gender, what position and body part is imaged, demographic data like when was the study acquired, what was what was like a, um, the acquisition parameters and things like that, as well as some display parameters like the window level and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's, it's a powerful format and we don't fully exploit everything about it. So I think earlier when we were talking about what are some of the things that you you think will happen in the future, I think some stuff will start to happen around exploiting this data that's embedded here in DICOM files. Um, I think in particular managers could use this data to further guide um, process improve improvements in workflow, reducing patient dose and improving equipment usage and reducing cost. There's always going to be a unique identifier that's used um, with the di between the RIS and the DICOM to uh, allow the computer to distinguish uh, the patient data. Um, and so we talk about accession numbers or order numbers. And these are, these are assigned to each imaging exam by the wrist. And so a lot of times when we're looking things up on PACS, it's really helpful to have that accession number. Um, different facilities use them differently. Um, and so you, you're never certain what it's going to be used for. And the unique identifier is it going to be an MR number, accession number. It's really facility dependent, but largely what's been adopted is accession numbers. And it should be placed in that DICOM header, header of every image acquired for, for the exam. Okay, let's get to uh, kind of the gold standard here, which is PACS, um, Picture Archiving and Communication System. And so it's, it's sometimes funny, people might say PACS system. That's not really correct. You would say PAC system, but it's um, PACS if you don't add the word system to the end. So this is a computer-based storage of digital images, and they can be retrieved, viewed, manipulated. You have worked with PACS now for two years. Um, it's completely obvious what all it can do. Um, I'm actually working on building a small PACS here at the school of um, our film library, and so I'm working with the juniors to, to build that right now. Um, it's going to have additional capabilities like uh, magnification, windowing, leveling, and, and adding image annotation. Um, and it's an evolving concept, so it's going to continue to parallel the availability of consumer electronics to capture and share digital images, much more so than, for example, our x-ray machine or my CT machine. Like, for example, there's no reason why at this point in time in history I couldn't run, for example, the CT machine with my cell phone using a Bluetooth connection, right? The reason that I can't do that is not limited to consumer electronics. It's limited to the obvious reason that it's not a good idea to run a CT machine off of a cell phone, right? Because anyone could then have access to it, perhaps, and be running all these um, radiation-producing machines from uh, perhaps a pirate network or something like that, as well as the protection of, of, of patient information. So the one thing that will limit the development of PACs will be the privacy settings required by these networks, firewalls and evolving uh, information encryption and compression, stuff like that. So, but it, it will continue, PACs will continue to evolve alongside of consumer electronics, meaning that, for example, I can pull up PACs images on my iPad, right, or on my cell phone. Um, and this is really driving a lot of, for example, um, computer, like physician order entering, um, even artificial, the development of artificial intelligence. We, because of PAC systems, we now have AI systems that can read um, or like do a general overread of, of images. Um, so it, it could be in the future that, like for example, um, the images that right now we send to the Nighthawk service are sent to a robot, and the robot does an overread and then or, or an initial an initial impression, and then that is then sent to a final. Uh, human radiologist to do the overread, uh, you know, first thing in the morning. So let's talk a little bit about that workflow, because that's kind of what I'm, I'm hinting at, is that these, these, the way that the future will be determined is largely based on our everyday workflow, like what we do in our department on a day-by-day -day basis. We typically start by um, capturing a digital image at whatever modality we're working at, we will look at the image real closely as technologists and make sure that it's accurate, is it labeled correctly, um, is, you know, is, is everything there on the image that we need, is it, is it a diagnostically optimal image. We'll send it over to PAX and then it's going to be viewed and interpreted by a physician and then that's electronically archived along with whatever report was generated. So what are some advantages of the system? Uh, and I, I actually had uh, the um, unfortune to work at one point in time in, in a film library, and it was miserable um, to, to sort through uh, 
films to, to, to file, like for example, a study and then have to file the report later on, or this doctor needs this report or this study and some other doctor has this report or this study. And working in the file room, you got yelled at a lot because um, it was a thankless job and everyone wanted the report and they wanted it yesterday. And where is it? Well, Dr. So-and-so took the films. We no longer have that problem, which is huge. So we, the major advantage of PACS is we can move images throughout the medical facility and even into other areas of the world at the, at the click of a button. Um, several different people can be viewing the images at the same time, and they can, we can search the images really rapidly. In fact, we can have the robot search the images ahead of us. Um, it's going to facilitate consultation with the patient. The results can be quickly distributed. Um, patient treatment can begin sooner. Um, we're going to spend less time uh, retrieving images. And of course, for the managers out there, it requires less staff in the file room. So um, it actually winds up being, there's some cost benefits here too. So let's talk about these requirements for ev what every PAX needs, regardless of how big or how small your facility is. Every PAX needs some DICOM compatibility. Um, it's going to have a digital for format as well as some kind of conversion capabilities. Um, there will be a PAX network access, so there'll have to be some way to access it. And then um, there'll be a way to register and send to the machine. Um, and we'll have to satisfy a number of different network protocols. Um, and so it, that's where maybe one of the sticking points can be is if the PAX network is down, then it can, it can slow things down. So this archive is huge. Um, and this is really going to be the major limiting point of, of PAX um, because this is the hardware that actually controls the PAX application software and, as well as the databases. And so these are going to be things like servers, um, multiple servers, redundant arrays, um, tape drives and jukeboxes, as well as some web-based servers. So there are some limitations, and uh, the biggest limitation is, is storage capability as well as compression. Um, so these images are huge. Um, like a single medical image may be four to five megabytes, just that one image. I mean, that's massive. Um, so an example that takes 400 images per day at four megabytes per file generates approximately 1.6 gigabytes of storage every single day. Um, so we have to find ways to manage that, create that generation of data. I mean, that's every hospital in Memphis is creating that kind of data. Um, think When you think about it at a global scale, this is what people are talking about when they're talking about big data. And finding not only ways to store it, but also ways to harness the value of that data, like 
we mentioned earlier, all this stuff that's embedded in DICOM headers, that's really where we're at. That is the state of the art. And there's a lot of limitations to why we don't master all of that. So the archiving equipment, the stuff that's going to help us manage this stuff, is going to be a QA workstation. This is typically where, uh, the best way to think of it, back in the day we had QA workstations where we actually sat and looked at images and determined if they were good or not. Um, that is not so much the case anymore because of the amount of workflow and, and the amount of imaging that we're doing. But generally this is where the technologist is going to be preparing the image and send it off to the PACs. There's a diagnostic workstation which is going to have a higher quality monitor. This is where the radiologist sits and does their reading. Um, there's a RAID, which is a redundant array of independent disks, and they're going to serve as a backup. So in case the images are uh, lost in one area, they'll be maintained in a different. The jukebox is really cool, and it's worth maybe uh, visiting the PAX room to see the jukebox. Um, it, I think the word jukebox is kind of demeaning to it, because this is a very, very large machine with robots inside of it. And the, it has robotic arms that move um, throughout the uh, jukebox and pull out different file disks and it takes them about two to five minutes to access something that's in that deep storage um, so part of uh, an essential part of, of how this PAX works w once things are sent to um, the archive is that there's a prefetching that automatically the robot automatically retrieves the information so for example say you had a patient scheduled for a chest x-ray this morning, um, the prefetch function of the jukebox will go and retrieve the chest x-ray that they had five years ago from the archive so that when the radiologist pulls it up to view it, um, they're looking at both the chest x-ray that was done today and the chest x-ray that was done five years ago in a pretty rapid sequence, not waiting five minutes between the two. Um, so there's a lot that goes into a RIS and that goes into a PAC system beyond just data entry. There's these artificial intelligence processes that are already embedded in the systems. Let's talk a little bit about um, LANs and WANs. Um, you know, when I was a kid, back in the day, we used to have LAN parties, and I don't think anyone really does that much anymore, um, but this is where we would really nerd out and play, I mean, at the time it was Counter-Strike or whatever. To do that, we, we couldn't just, like, dial up, um, I don't even know how folks do it anymore on, like, the Xbox or whatever, but it's pretty, it seems pretty obvious you can just connect to each other. We had to, like, sit in the same room with each other and bring our computers over to the same room and connect them, and it was painful. It took, like, two hours just to connect the computers up and stuff. But a LAN is a local area network, and so I, I have painful memories related to how local it has to be, like, in the same room. It's going to be a small area. It's going to, um, it can transfer uh, data really quickly. It's typically privately owned. Um, it would make no sense to have, like, a bunch of computers in one one room that isn't other than privately owned, and it's gonna have, it's gonna be very secure. And so this is typically how we um, manage things like um, uh, HIPAA for hospitals with our hisses and our risses Is we just have a LAN because it's it's enclosed to itself. Nothing can come into the out from the outside because it has no access to the outside. Um, versus a wide area network, this this might be something global or something across a city. It's going to function at a slower rate because it has to transfer data over phone lines or, or wirelessly or whatever across satellites. Um, this might be commercially or publicly operated. Like In fact, there's even um, cities that have their own wide area network. Um, and it will have privacy as well as open or leased lines of communication. And a big example of this would be any kind of teleradiology system or just the internet itself. So let's talk a little about teleradiology. Initially, this meant any, and this predates PACs, right? Tel teleradiology came before PACs, and it was a way to distribute um, PACs images over phone lines. That's why the tele is still out there. Um, and it, it is relied now to this day on IP addresses, so internet protocols, as well as network switch routers and firewalls. And so this is typically, teleradiology is typically the way that people do Nighthawk reading. Um, or um, off-site reading is normally handled by a teleradiology system, largely for security reasons as well as for software connectivity. 
and that's it. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, there's an activity that's also available. I encourage you to, to take some time to make sure you understand this these terminology, and that's, that's largely what we're interested in, is just making sure we understand this terminology and where some of the errors might come with the use of it, like, for example, the need for prefetching um, or whenever there's connectivity issues with either the HL7 or uh, formatting problems with DICOM headers and, and just better controlling the flow of information in our department. Thanks.